Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Property Management Show, a podcast brought to you by Foreign Taff, a marketing agency for property managers like you. Wouldn't it be nice to know that your marketing is constantly improving even if you're out there doing other things? Well, contact us at Four and Half to find out how to do that. Yep. All right, so now let's get into it. Last week, we spoke to Dave Gorham about why standardizing your systems is important. And this week, we are going to go deeper into that with him to figure out exactly how to do that and the things that you need to look at. So make sure you're taking down notes because this has the potential to transform your business. Dave, welcome back. Thank you for joining us for part two. Episode two. Episode two. Last season. Yeah. This season on the Property Management Show with Marie, Dave, and Brittany Starr. Excellent Um, point. Ask me about Brittany Starr someday. Um, But so last week, uh, we obviously talked about standardized processes. Why um, you need it for your property management company. Yep. Benefits. Um, Obstacles. So today, we want to pick your brain and hear more about the how. I guess it's like the process behind creating your standardized processes. So I'm Dave Gorham. Um, I, I am the founder and president of Realty Solutions. We're a New Jersey based property management company. Um, soon to rule the world. So we'll, we'll uh, stay tuned on that. Um, so one of the reasons why I believe we're successful uh, now with a lot of hindsight is because we did embrace um, some sense of an organizational chart or organization. And um, I was an early adopter of job descriptions. So that came from painful experience with employees. Um, my assumption, it's actually not an assumption, it's an expectation, right? So I have an ex- expectation on what Brittany does, you have an expectation on what I do as a client and a vendor, right? Unless we have a written contract, we can't rely on anything to discuss why we're out of expectation, mm-hmm. right? Yours are here, mine are there, that kind of stuff. So I learned really early on in other businesses why it was important to do it. So um, when we were very small, we at least had job descriptions for myself, for my business partner, and we had um, one quasi-property manager bookkeeper. So they were short and they were easy. We all knew what our jobs were. So that allowed us to kind of expand. So it was really kind of born out of – past failures that showed me that everybody needs to know what their job is, including me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it can't be just up here. The fact that there's a description means it's written down somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So if I said, if I said to you, um, I'm the president, you're the bookkeeper and that's it. You have an expectation. What's your expectation of a president and what they're going to do or your expectation of a bookkeeper or property manager or whatever salesperson. Yeah. Like, unless it's written down, we don't know what our true job is. We can right, assume it could be different. It, that word could mean something different at every company. every company. Like for for example, uh, at four and a half, we have account managers that manage the marketing campaigns for our clients. If you Google right. the term account manager, which you've actually talked about changing that name pretty recently, mm-hmm. um, for, you, for you guys, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's like when I think of an account manager, I think of a customer service representative almost. Because other mm-hmm. industries have taken that term and defined it for themselves, and it's so pervasive for themselves. that mm-hmm. it's now not giving justice to what our account managers currently They're do. They're marketing strategists. That's what they are. Yeah. They're, it's yeah. definitely campaign oversight, and there are, there are words for it, but... I feel like that also kind of ties back into when you're advertising for roles, because if you don't mm-hmm. have your role defined, somebody yeah. that's seeking you out or people that you're seeking out are going to have different expectations, even from the point when they're looking to work with you. Another reason why you'd want that, because you're going to need to hire somebody later anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Once you do that, your job description becomes a classified ad or whatever step one before you can do anything it's like get get those roles defined yeah yeah um uh you made me think of like the uh it's creative license right so if we don't 
if we don't spell out, or we have this experience with four and a half in Realty Solutions, right? We don't spell out what, what we're doing. We can go out of scope. So it's so easy to talk about out of scope, right? Because we all know what it is, but you really don't know what it is until you spell it out on a contract. Yeah. So, and I think you and I even had that challenge uh, a couple of years ago. It's like, okay, so what's a producer and what's an account manager and what's a salesperson and who are you to me and who am I to you as a client? Like, where's the roles? Right. So we had to, we had to identify that. And sometimes you customize something, but the agreement is we're going to customize it specifically for this. Yeah. Relationship, right. Mm -hmm. So again, it's something written. You wouldn't, we wouldn't take on a property management client without a contract. Right. Right. So same thing for employees. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think, and we've expanded that idea. So um, we talked about in the last episode, something about um, something that I call agreements. Right. So we use that in the, in the domain of our business, right? As soon as you walk in the door of the business, the agreement is defined by something that is uh, out loud and written and agreed to by two people, right? So everyone in the company can create a new agreement with someone else, but it has to be in writing, which means it has to be described. There has to be consequences, good and bad, and there has to be a way to clean it up if someone doesn't do it. Right. So very simply, that could be a, a, a precursor to a job description, yeah. which is for, for us too, in your business, the same It's a precursor to a compensation package. Mm -hmm. Right. And then when you move that, where does that fit inside an organizational chart? And then from there, what is the performance improvement plans for each job and what's the KPI and everything just kind of like trickles down. So we started with job descriptions and now we're at a place, um, you know, 20 years later, now I've got agreements. I have job descriptions. I have, um, the, the, uh, the compensation plan, the organizational chart and PIPs and KPIs for every single person. Yeah. Right. So it's not something that happens magically. You don't have right. like a book of this. I mean, I guess you can go to Mark Cunningham and buy all his systems. Right. But uh -huh. sure. That's a little plug for Mark, but, to, to that point, you can do it yourself slowly over time as long as you have that mindset. Yeah. And who, who does it? Like you, you've you done it. Did you and your partner do it for your team? Who or? initiates it in the company? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think anyone with the desire to have a better structure and have more fun at work, we talked about last time, like if you have those guardrails, it really provides a, an area to have more fun. Mm -hmm. Because the questions are taken out of it. Like, where's my, where's my boundary, right? So for us, it's like, you can have fun with it. So anyone can do it. I do believe that it starts with the leader at the top, whoever that might be. That might be someone, not senior leadership, but some director of property manager, or even a property manager, right? Mm -hmm. They could do that for themselves. So I think it's best done by the leader of the company. It doesn't necessarily have to be the owner. Um, but someone from secretarial to bookkeeping to property management sales to the owner can do it. Absolutely. And, and the frustration around presenting these things is really um, you have to kind of shed your ego on it. Cause one of the things that, that we just, we just scrapped everything in, in November and December and rebuilt it and came out from uh from maybe 12 employees down to, uh, up to 20. So we had to assimilate. So we couldn't do that without having a new organizational chart. Yeah. So it was really scary for some people, right? Um, Cause I think the first, like what, when I say organizational chart, what do you guys think of? Typically, right? It's a bunch of boxes connected by lines. Yeah, I mean like I right. think of the hierarchy yeah. almost within the company and- Hierarchy, hierarchy of what? Leadership. Could be, right? Yeah, so it, like accountability. Account, accountability, yes. Yeah. So like leadership, accountability. Um, who who do I go to if I have a problem? Yeah, good. And like a yeah. process for escalating things. Yeah. Those yep. are the typical like connotations of an org chart, right? Yeah. yeah. What team handles what types of issues? Uh, like who's on the sales team? Who handles our finances? Like those are the yeah. types of things – I usually think of like yeah. well, I'm, I'm mostly I'm just like thinking about our org chart. Um, well, right. Cause you internalize it. Like, how does it feel for me? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's a com there's a really negative common denominator in 
putting an org chart out without any notice or just org chart in general that everyone looks at it like again a negative common denominator is that it's it's a superiority yeah picture right <clears throat> what we what i chose to do what we chose to do is make it we didn't call it an organizational chart we we called it an operational flow chart so that we got rid of the idea or tried to tried to um, instill in upon everyone's name is on here is that even if someone's name is above you, it doesn't show that they're above you in a superiority aspect, right? Superior or, or um, subordinate. It shows you to Marie's point. It shows you where you go. If you have a question yeah. or where you go outside of the guidelines of, of a standardized system, right? Last time we talked about the standardized system gives you an opportunity to have conversations. So who are you going to have those conversations with? If you look at an org chart, you might not want to have it three levels above you because that person three levels above you, in that case, maybe it might be me, mm -hmm. might not know what you're doing functionally exactly. right? in the day-to-day the -day business. Someone else might, might be there to be able to help. And that goes for me too. Like I might have a, I might have a specific question for a property manager, but when it comes to some policy and some ideas, I really have to go to my director of property management to have those conversations, right? I'm, I'm bypassing down the line mm -hmm. and not getting the information that I need. So it's an operational thing. And it's a way to, to have accountability for the, not for, it's accountability for yourself, right? So you see where you sit in the org chart you see what your job description is, what the agreement was, you know what your job is. So you're accountable for yourself. So there's no questions. You don't do your job. There's a consequence to it. It shows up. Yeah, I like that. So for you, the way that you present it to your team, it's, it's almost like its own process flow, mm -hmm. but yeah. for well, the operation structure. Yeah. Well, and also a decision-making structure too, right? So it's not just operating the business, it's decisions. Yeah. So um, Mike did a uh, podcast and I can't remember what it was, but it was about- Yeah, workflow, so right? our, our COO, Mike Lushington, Michael Lushington, um, mm -hmm. he um, months ago yeah. did like three blogs. Um, so the first one was um, how to get in touch with your property management company mm -hmm. through workflows. Right. You know, what are the elements of a good workflow for property managers and how to implement workflows without being a micromanager. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he did that for us cause yeah. he, he, that's like his yeah, like area. He did that for four and a half because before, before he came to our team, um, everybody kind of had an idea in their head of like, who does what, you know, who do I go to if something breaks in this area versus that mm -hmm. area. But before him, nothing had been written in like paper. Right. So you we were did, successful. We didn't have the standardized systems that were we're talking about right here. Yeah. So you were successful up to that point, but then you have more people and a new leader. It's bound to break. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, kudos to him and you guys for kind of embracing that. And what you said was you have the idea in your head, which is great because we're smart. Right. But it's also dangerous because we haven't seen what our idea looks like on paper. Right. So I, I keep pointing to this, like we, I've made binders for everybody that are, that shows the business it's, it's not an employee manual, right? So to, to Mike's point in the podcast, the workflow, I'm not a micromanager. So what my job is, to, is to create policy and procedures based off of how it works well. And that becomes a conversation with everybody. So then what I'll do is I'll separate each one of those best practices into a policy. Now there's, they're an advertising vehicle because I can post it on the website. I could talk about it in a blog, right? Um, give it to an employee when they're, uh, that's it. I'm not supposed to use that word. It's a team member. So we're changing our language too in our company. <clears throat> give it to, to a team member who might be struggling with a, a certain situation, whether it's a screening, pets or fair housing or something as simple as rent collection, right? Oh, remember we have a best practice policy on this. Here it is, right? And it's not an employee manual that they have to thumb through. Yeah. Individual pieces that eventually make a larger body of work so that the whole company can move forward without me. Right. So talk about, um, PM grow summit 
uh, yeah. shameless plugs. So that's what my partner Rob and I got out of the last one. So we sat with Scott Fritz, I think his name was, mm-hmm. and it was about building your business so that you could leave. Yes. Right? And that's, we took that to heart and that's what we, that's it. as soon as we left, that's what we started to do. Speaking of PM Grow, you don't want to miss this year's conference if you're hungry for growth. It's coming up May 27th through May 29th, 2020 in Austin, Texas. So if you haven't registered, seriously, get registered now. And not only will you learn from some amazing speakers and leaders in the property management industry, you will also get to meet myself and Brittany. If you're not registered, like Marie said, go to pmgrowsummit.com and register. Hope to see you there. So now I have... um, you know, it's, it's always a work in progress, progress, but right now if I got hit by a bus, that policy and procedure manual that has best practices, that has an org chart, that has the agreements, has the job descriptions, has um, performance improvements, has KPIs, what it doesn't have is rent scale stuff, which will be shoved in there. And they're next, right? yeah. I could get hit by a bus and or leave the company, um, and knock on wood, I have enough money to leave the company, and it could survive without me. Yeah. So that, that's I mean, that's, goal. it's totally not the, the bus part, but yeah, the bus parts. Yeah. Although if you're going to go, I mean, yeah, see how it goes. And, and I love how, um, you are, you, you guys are trying so hard to not just change the way people look at their jobs by mm-hmm. not calling it an org chart. It's an organizational mm-hmm. flow thing. Yeah. This is a, you yeah, know, cause you're thing. right. It does have that like negative cause I've seen such big organizational charts for like big companies where if I'm, if, if you plan on scaling to be like a national brand or something, if I'm a new employee at a national company and I look at this org chart, like that's huge and doesn't really have any meaning to me, then what's it, what's the purpose of it? What's it doing? It's too big. It's too big, right? You yeah. care about you. You feel like an ant. Well, yeah, Yeah. but it's even, but I'm saying if it's done the right way, it could still be big, but it means something to you. So what you're saying um, that is working for you is making it more about the people. And I'm sorry, I always, no, it's okay. You said it before you said it before and I wrote it down. It's creative license, right? Mm -hmm. So once that org chart, whether it's operational or it's hierarchy, uh, and all the other components are written somewhere, even if they're short, everyone has creative license and cr- and critical thinking inside their job, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not just about the creating the culture here, but once the culture is created here, it expands out to the residents, mm-hmm. right? It expands out to the clients, and it expands out to the vendors that we use, right? So now we actually have a better litmus test uh, not just a tenant screening, right? Not just a um, uh, a client intake. We got a better litmus test because we know who we are and we can hear when someone is talking and they're not like us, mm. right? This is going to be a bad resident. Yep. This is not going to be our target client, mm-hmm. right? This vendor doesn't talk the way we talk. It might They might not be a fit. Right. So it provides a lot of other um, ancillary... Um, uh, benefits than just to your point, a national company putting people's names on because that's who you got to call when you have a problem. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, it does something, it does something for everybody. Yeah. It starts something in you, even the simple act of, you know, trying to call team members, team members rather than employees, that Mm -hmm. simple act changes the way the employee shows up at work and like, you know, deals with, people and thinks of his or herself. Yeah. One of the, this is a little bit, maybe even off topic, but it reminds me of something that we're often told, um, here at, at four and a half. Um, we're just, since we're giving Michael Lushington all the love, one of the things that he always emphasizes, and it's also like in relation to the org chart is if I'm, if I'm accountable for a team, uh, in the organizational chart. It's not me telling them what to do. It's them telling me what they need from me. 
to yeah. empower them to yeah. do their job. What, what, what do I need to do? You, you're my boss, essentially. Tell me what I need to do to give you what you need. And yeah, I think you're there, you're there for their support. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think that just the way that you're describing it aligns a lot with that methodology. It's the accountability thing, right? So if you choose the micromanage and the accountabilities to me, it doesn't create, give you creative license or even, even to be a critical thinker. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so we were in a position last year that um, our business was so dumbed down for a number of different reasons that we had people in place that were not accessing critical thinking. They were pushing a button. They were making a phone call. They were sending something out, but they weren't creatively thinking about it or critically thinking about it. Like I want my team to think as if they own the property. Mm-hmm. What would they, how would they spend the money? Yeah. Would they do this and be happy with that? Would their spouse be happy with that investment that they own together, right? Mm-hmm. Or even the resident, would they be happy with that interaction coming back as a resident, right? Short of, you know, we have tense situations, we have clients that aren't great, we have residents that aren't great. Short of that, would you be happy with that decision that you're making for your client? I'm curious, you mentioned that sometime last year in that position where you know, people were not cr- using their critical thinking. How did you end up that way? Like, yeah, it's a great. I'm, question. I'm curious, right? Because a lot of a lot of times, people get into the rhythm of like, oh, this is how we're doing things, and then one day you wake up, you're like, this is not how I imagined it to be. Right. Like, so just walk us through how you got there and how you realized, yeah. right, that you yeah. were in that situation. Yeah. The the part of the answer is. And we talk about a lot of this um, with companies like Lead Simple, companies like you guys, and us growing. Is that there's there are there are points in the business that you grow 150 units to 1,000 units, a totally different business now. So you mm-hmm. have to think completely differently. So in that sense, um, I will take blame for it because I'm the leader. So it was my my eye off the ball. And not recognizing that um, that the business had changed, right? Due to higher workload, a different client, and more doors, right? Mm-hmm. I I thought, oh, it'll work because it worked yesterday, right? So I let it go on too long, and there wasn't enough there wasn't enough creative license that I gave to the team because they were employees back then. Mm-hmm. Um, I gave them enough creative license so that they were just pushing buttons, right? So in, in that course of action, we just had, you know, high maintenance clients and residents and, and noisy stuff that happened that, you know, you know, people just frustrates people. So that was the trigger, right? Mm-hmm. For me is um, everyone hates it when I say it, but uh, when they start asking me a question, I will ask them, uh, does this sound noisy to you? Like, this is noise to me. Your question is noisy. So Mm -hmm. figure out what the real question is. Get the noise out. Ask a black and white question because everything else is noise. So your client is bringing you noise. Your resident is bringing you noise. Simplify it into your job. Mm -hmm. And the the question will be answered. You still might have to deal with the noise. And that's also emotional, right? So you can deal with emotions, but you have to have a logical solution to it because we deal with contracts. Yeah. I love that. You're shaking your head. Yes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, 100% because yeah. I, I, noise is such a good way to put it. Um, look at the facts. If the facts aren't clear, then ask for clarification sure. and then keep going. I think, yeah, I, yeah, I love that. Yeah, because if you think about it this way, it's kind of like a disease, right? Like the noise <laughs> yes. are the symptoms. If you just keep treating the symptoms, it's going to keep coming back. So if yes. you... Yeah. Yeah. You have to figure out what the actual cause is and then right. get rid of that and get rid of everything else. 100%. Um, if we take it down to what I was experiencing is very much like the DMV and the jokes that we make about the DMV. They're just pushing buttons. Yeah. That's it. And they frustrate their customers, who's us, right? Because it's government. We feel we can't push back. And when you push back, you get blocked. That's not the business that we want to be in right? Mm -hmm. You guys can't, can't afford it. Otherwise I wouldn't hire you. Owners couldn't, I couldn't afford it. Otherwise they wouldn't hire me. Right. So we want to kind of limit that noise and be more, um, 
empathy is not the right way to deal with it. In my opinion, it's compassion, right? Yeah. So you can be compassionate and come down on the, on the negative decision for the person on the other side, mm -hmm. but showing that compassion allows them to accept the negative decision. Yeah. yeah. To, to tie it back to like job description. So we talked about why it's important to put it down, not just keep it in your head so that if, you know, someone gets hit by a bus, everyone can kind of like pull the pieces together and keep moving the organization forward. Right. But in terms of like what should be mm -hmm. in those job descriptions, yeah. it's becoming more clear to me that you should, a, a lot of people have this connotation that a job description is like the tasks that you have to do. Like if it right. was a PA, like you get me coffee, answer my phone calls, yep. set up my calendar. Mm -hmm. But like- It might be how you do that. What? It might be how you do that, right? How yeah. do you get me coffee? But then I feel like there's- coffee with a smile. Yeah, but, but there right. has to be like a section in your job description that ties the job to the overall, you know, mm -hmm. um, the overall organization. Right. Like how do you- how do you fit into the org? How do you make the org a better mm -hmm. place? Yeah. Like kind of make them feel like without this role, we can't run versus, yeah. oh, we're just not going to get coffee then. Right. Like, yeah, right. it's the why, right. It's the why you're doing it. So if you, and if you're smart enough to have a job description and that's it, the why's is important. So you're explaining that perfectly. It's like, so why do I need you to get me coffee? I'm perfectly capable to go and getting coffee myself. But if you provide me with coffee, I might be able to do more by not having the distraction. Now, if you're, I was going to use a bad word again. If you're a jerk about getting me my coffee, that's going to create frustration for you and for me. So to your point, like, why are you getting me coffee in a certain way? Mm -hmm. Right? So from that job description, why are you interacting with that resident in a certain way? So mm -hmm. that was another uh, class that we had about the difference between empathy and compassion. They're both really powerful skills to have in life as a human being, but empathy has no business in property management. Yeah. Compassion does. Cause when you, when you have empathy for someone, it means that you're putting yourself in their place. So now you're getting dirty with them. You're getting noisy with them. And now you can't see a clear way path for them, right? To solve their problem. And that's what we're doing. We're solving people's problems. Yeah. You can be compassionate, right? But if you're compassionate, you can see the clear black and white answer. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people confuse the two, not just in property management. And in, in all everything. the time. It's, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to separate the, the two. The most common is. thing is when you're trying to instill um, compassion, like when you're talking to someone, the typical phrase they use is, if you were in their shoes, what would you feel? But it's right. like, yeah, but it's different when you understand how the other person is feeling and going through versus feeling it with them right. and getting stuck in that like, you know, negative space and then unable to, you know, use critical thinking to figure out, okay, how can we get out of this cycle? Right. Um, and I think that's, that's important. But you can train yourself. Like I am a naturally empathetic person me and too. it took me, I, that's we, a, I think that's a lot a skill. of people are. Yeah, that's a skill. That's a talent that you had that you developed into a skill. It's a strength for you, which is why that makes you, you. Right. Right. But it needs to be tempered in certain areas. Exactly. And it takes time. But it, like the fact that, um, who was in this class? Was it you and the team or? Everybody. Everybody. Everyone. Like that's amazing. The fact that you're putting that training in place, that's something I, I I had to learn on my own mm -hmm. and just was able to do because I'm a logical person. Like trial and error kind of, right? Ex exactly. But if you're mapping it out for people and you're able to explain the differences but yeah. to so them. I had, I, had, I had you as my office manager and lead property manager. She was highly empathetic, which made her a beautiful person, right? But it got in her way of doing her job. So it was constant coaching on a weekly basis and that, and worthwhile for both of us, right? That she separate her empathetic feelings towards the situation and just bring compassion. And her job is to solve a problem, black or white. Right. And, and the, the problems are usually solved going back to something written, whether it's your job description or a lease or the property management contract. It's already all written. It's how you come to that decision and communicate it, which is really what's important. Yep. Right. So if you can bring compassion to it, you're validating them, but the, the empathy doesn't cloud, your empathetic feelings don't cloud how you 
give that information because guess what? They can sense that you don't agree with the decision. They could sense that you feel guilty. They can yep. sense that you feel so bad. So guess what? They're not going to pay their rent this week. They're going to pay it next week when they promised you this week. Yeah, absolutely. So, so and com- being compassionate, that's much more beneficial to both parties Yeah, because you're able to get, th- yeah, through the noise. That's like the whole point. You get through the noise, you get to the objective mm-hmm. and you move on. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's um, the difference between, you know, uh, DMV, which would be black and white, no questions asked, no critical thinking and empathy on the other side where you can't even make a critical thought. It's right in the middle. Right. So, so what I used to say to her, which is what I would say to you, if I was working with you is a strength overused is your biggest weakness. Right. So if you know what your strength is, you can't rely on it all the time. Yeah. And you, well, you have to get strong in other places too. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, exactly yeah. what yeah. you just flex said other in a muscles. way, but it's like, you can be, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, you can hone other strengths, which if you do over the course of years, that's great. But if you're able to work with your team and get them to kind of follow the light sooner. So that brought up something for me. So one of my, one of my, um, top team member, salesperson, property manager, uh, he, he struggled. So one of my team members has high empathy. Another one has low empathy. Doesn't make them good or bad people, right? It's just their, the way they come to that. I have to access something different and coach him differently under his job description and in the org chart to have him access some other skill, like you just said, so that it compensates for his low empathy because the low empathy can come off as a jerk, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, and he's not a jerk. He's very compassionate, not accessing it in time, in that time. So his coaching, you know, would be trying to come up with, Oh, what are the, what are the strengths and the talents that you have that we could rely on so that when you get into trouble with your resident or client or your job or your team member, that you can overcompensate in one skill so that it doesn't create that weakness on the other one. Mm -hmm. Would you ever recommend that those two opposite personality types like work together and bounce ideas off of each other? Or is that just a bad situation? So a, a dramatic or noisy issue that's happening that we have to respond to as owners or property managers or bookkeepers or secretary, whatever it might be. um, It's always best to have another set of eyes looking at it because we're too emotionally attached to our answer or to the, or the to the issue that's coming to us. So absolutely. Um, to your point, if I would have put that with those two people, that would have been great, right? Because they both would have learned, again, you're not trying to change people, right? And you, and you will not change them. Mm-hmm. So I can't work with you on your weakness and have you feel really good about it, right? Let's work on what you're bad at, right? Yeah. That's not going to work. So we want to work at what you're that good way. at. Yeah, right. So it's, it's how you put it too. Um, but but just in doing that, I think that goes a long a long way. Well, what my takeaway from that was, um, you get a lot of resistance whenever there's change, right? Yeah. And Absolutely. like like you were talking about, you found the company in a shape that was just not. Um, was not good. It wasn't healthy. It wasn't scalable because you had people who were not living to their highest potential, right? Because if they're not yeah. using their critical thinking, they're just mm-hmm. pushing, pushing buttons. Let's face it. They may not stick for long because they're empty inside. Yeah. They're just pushing That's buttons, a good point. right? right. Um, and so you had to make a change. And so sure. um, it, it sounds to me like that training about empathy, was that in response to you wanting to overhaul the company and then you found out that that was a skill everyone had to learn or was that overcome? Yeah. 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 So that's a good question. Um, no, that, that, that is, that imagines that I had an idea (laughs) to go back and fix something when really it just came out of, um, an initial dramatic situation that more than three people had to deal with. Right. So if I'm, if I'm tracking back correctly, it was probably a tenant or an owner situation. And again, we talked about this last time about 
agreements and expectations, right? So the expectations were out of alignment, but the group or the person was focusing on the noise, not the fact that they were out of alignment. And mm -hmm. once, once they could see where that other person was without empathy, they could see what the, what the solution was. Again, it's, you have a job description, you have a lease, you have a contract. So it was right there. Right. Right. So in, in my, in my, um, my coaching career, so personal development coaching, the idea of mindset, like we look at empathy and compassion, it gets in the way. So I just pulled that right out of yeah. um, the coaching piece and brought it into the company as an, as a lesson of this is where empathy is stopping you from being a good uh, steward of someone's property or a good property manager to your resident, whatever it might be. It so this like is something thing. you put like, like I think that's how we're tying it back to it's something you, you might put in your job description. Your yeah. job is to be compassionate, not empathetic, require, required training. Point. I'm going to do that. That's a great point. Well, I, I think I, that's really good because it's, it's like, it's so easy to get. I'm trying to think of other, other examples uh, of, of the two. Cause I mean, there are obviously billions of situations. Well, I'll give you a good example. So yeah. this is one of, um, one of the things that actually started to change my mind towards customer service is my, you know, Ritz Carlton. Mm -hmm. right? So they don't treat, they treat their customer, they call their customers, ladies and gentlemen. They also call their team employees, ladies and gentlemen, always. So I had an experience in Orlando. I went with a friend to a Ritz Carlton. Um, he does work in the area. His wife actually does blogs for the uh, travel industry and she was going to an event there. So we went we spent the day at the pool uh, philosophizing and figuring out business and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then met for dinner at another hotel next door, got in one of their cars. They drove us over, dropped us off. Uh, we had dinner. We came out. The car was gone. There was no driver. So we asked them for help. And without any hesitation, they took about 20 minutes. They said, okay, we'll get you a car. And they got a car and they drove us back. They didn't know who we were. And I found out through my friend, we didn't pay anything to be at that other hotel. We just walked in, used their facilities. No, we paid for food and stuff, but used right. their facilities. No one once asked us if we were supposed to be there, if we were guests, what we were doing. We just walked right out and asked for a car to drive us. They never asked anything. They said yes. So everything that they do is yes. And ladies and gentlemen, no one ever asked us whether or not we were um, uh, hotel guests. Wow. Nor did they know that um, my friend's wife was raiding a event that was there. Never asked. Didn't occur to them, right? Because they trained that. That's their compassion, right? So I brought that a year or two ago and trying to figure out how could we do that in the property management yeah. area? Like how do we get these, these, um, you know, desperate and annoying tenants that call us and it's so horrible. And now we got to figure out it's really not that right. So we have to be compassionate and treat them like we, we, we say they're residents, not tenants, right? Yeah. Not a big switch, but it is a switch. Yeah. So that goes right to your point. I think I'm actually going to go back and look at, um, to another point you made is that you're all this stuff is living and breathing. So, you know, I'm going to go and change it now. And then Tuesday on our meeting, I'm going to say what I learned from you guys, right? That we will put something about how you act. Cause that makes more sense now to me. Yeah. After I heard it, after I heard it from you saying it. Well, it just makes sense to be clear, clearly defined too. And I think what, what I really, I like the living and breathing idea of it because you, you know, you, you have your binder. That's not something you made in a day. No. That's something that you're continually building. We use Google drive for everything. Don't give me a piece of paper. I will lose it. Um, and to save the trees and to save the trees. We care about the environment. Um, but it, it's great to get that 
idea to pass back through your description because I want to add it to ours now too. Right. We have our, our account manager description or whatever we decide to call it, that should be changed and that should be included because sometimes people might think, oh, I need to act on this end of the sp spectrum or I need right. to act on this end. Um, yeah. Where if it's clearly defined, you can ask questions if you don't understand it, but if it's not there, you don't really know what questions to ask. I think right. it sets the stage because a lot of times, like if you're, to our listeners, if you're a member of like various like social media groups, right, of property managers, like once in a while, you know, somebody has a bad day and like rants about like a bad tenant, a bad mm -hmm. owner or a bad like, you know, situation and it's one thing to rant. It's another to start vilifying the person of like, yeah. oh, that like evil tenant and yeah. um, like to each. Like they're own, doing right? it to but you. If, yeah, but it like, sets the stage. If in your company, everyone's like, oh, that like, oh, that like, uh, that annoying tenant who like always calls to mm -hmm. ask questions. Like, can't you just read a lease? You know, like if you um, keep talking like that, um, someone who's more neutral may start thinking like that, and then it fosters mm -hmm. this negative. Yeah. Um, way of thinking of who the tenant is and yeah. if you make it well, clear culture right yeah you start to yeah. change the culture yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so it just takes one bad apple right like if yeah. that was never an issue before that's why it's not in your job description and it's one bad apple it just like has a different makeup right it has a different right. way of perceiving things and starts like bad mouthing certain tenants like maybe they're annoying but like what they did was annoying but you can't say that that person is annoying, period. Right, and you don't know There's, why why yeah. they're doing what they do. You don't know where they got their information from. Right. There's, uh, a, there's a fine line between venting and commiserating, right? And yeah. to, to your point about vilifying, right? Because when we vilify it, we're assuming they're doing it to us. Mm -hmm. So now we become the victim. So for, for us in property management, if managing a property was easy, they wouldn't need us. Yeah. So everything we do is um, uh, messy and dirty and a lot of work. Otherwise, we wouldn't have jobs. So we have to remember that. Part of the job description helps you to remember that. And, and t to your point about um, venting, it's not, we're not super men and super women and, and totally robots where an annoying tenant isn't going to annoy us. They can annoy us. They should annoy us because we're human beings. It's how you deal with that annoyance. Go and vent. And then come back with a solution that makes sense. Um, one of the other things that, that sticks in my head, and I need to say it more uh, to my team, is that every question asked does not have to have an immediate answer. You can go, you can say, I will f find that out later, X time. I was just going to ask you that. Because cause I, I tell that to our team too, if there's... A, if there's any emotion that you're feeling, let that emotion pass and yeah. then respond. But you can't always do that in property management. If it's, yeah. if it's an emergency or something, what's your recommendation to them in those types of situations? Uh, have a best practice and a policy and a standardized system on how to deal with an emergency. Bingo. There you go. <laughs> right? Because then you can be hysterical, but you have a checklist. And you just go one item at a time. And you yeah. can be hysterical when you do it, but you know what the path is. So, so guess what? Anybody could do it at that point. Mm -hmm. That's you know, a great emergency. segue I know. Yeah, <laughs> to operational flows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, yeah. let's talk about what's, what's your recommended method for, for making mapping out the operational mm -hmm. flows once you have the job descriptions, you have the operation structure or company organizational um, you said you call it operation structure. I, th I think yeah. operation, said operational, operation flow. operational flow. Yeah. yeah. So I would start either with an organizational chart that defines who the characters are and they're playing that role. Right. And then the question would be, does everyone have a job description? And it doesn't have to be to your point. It doesn't have to have everything that they do and how they do it. It's a tone. It's the idea of the job overarching kind of idea of the job. And then then a key, one of the key questions is, are they compensated correctly for that job? So you should have a separate compensation type document. And to get deeper in with maybe culture, you can have an agreement at each level. 
like the property management team has, has their type of agreements on how they deal with clients. Bookkeeping has another one. Sales has another one. So you could keep d diving in and getting deeper and deeper in this. It all depends on how far you want to go with it. Um, but organizational chart, whether it's hierarchy or if it's operational flow, whatever, should have absolutely have that no matter how big you are. And then a job description. Because what are you going to start with? KPIs or a performance improvement plan for someone who doesn't have a job description? Yeah. Right? It's ridiculous. Which people do sometimes and then they yeah. – they realize get they get frustrated <laughs> because it's not working. So it's ridiculous. So I, I have, um, I have a property manager now. Um, she's great. And we talked about me taking responsibility for the past, right? She didn't get the training and the uptick when she was first hired. She did a great job without me looking at her work. Now I'm looking at the work and I, I am not confident that we can scale with the quality of work that she had been doing. It's not that she's bad. It's not that she's doing a bad job. It's that we're moving further and farther than what the job used to be. So I'm not going to let her go, right? Um, we're going to be honest about it, transparent as a group and also uh, privately about what it's going to take to be better at the new job, mm -hmm. right? So that's another example of, you know, you fail forward, right? So there, there was a failure there that we didn't even know that happened. Yeah, so talking about like, uh, operational flows like separate from the way the organization flows and which mm -hmm. members flow to which departments and stuff um mm -hmm. like great example training like there has mm -hmm. to be a workflow for, for yeah. training like the onboarding process and so that yeah. was obviously missed right this property manager apparently is a star player because she she was not trained but she figured out her way mm -hmm. right yes 100 um, but she was dropped it. She was dropped in the position because of uh, the interview process and what we knew she could do. Right. Wow, so there was an expectation on both sides that we shouldn't have relied on so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like that happens more that, often than not. I, yeah. Well, right? yeah, because I mean, even you, it, it's a, another example of where a title of a role could be different at one company from another company and why the description and the kind of like theme of the job is so important. My property management is different than my competitors or someone else, right? So if I, or even self-managed. So if I hire a property manager, I'm hiring all the good and bad habits. Mm. So it's, it makes sense to have your own good habits to train them on how you want the work done. Right. Otherwise it's a failure on us, me, not them. Yeah. So how, and we don't have to use this specific situation as an example, but going back to what Marie was saying, how, how do you start mapping out that, that new training process or that new kind of workflow, um, to move forward? Well, um, what helps us is, so we have, um, we don't have a, um, kind of a, a job description or roles defined so much that if I hired you as a property manager, there's a book and if this, then that. Uh, I could see a future that we might have something like that. What works for us now is we have policies and procedures and best practices. So we'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, each thing that someone does is written in a document mm -hmm. and that document is, um, can be viewed to the public um, website, PDF, client, vendor, um, resident, team member, but it's not in a book, here you go, this is everything we do. It's not a handbook, right? It's a, oh, I have a rent collection process problem, or this eviction isn't going well, why? We have a process for it, let's go back to the process, let's look at the document, let's see if anything was missed, right? So from that standpoint, it allows the workflow, it allows the creative license and the critical thinking to happen Mm -hmm. outside of having a micromanaged process. Yeah. That's my feeling right now. And that, that, that works for us. But again, if I double again in three years, that might not work. So I'm open to the idea that I have to get more granular. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that covers a lot of buckets for me, I, you know, cause I could do, I could do a lot of work with you in four and a half with each one of those best practices. We talked about it already, right? Each one of those things is an advertising vehicle. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I, I love how um, you said that, yeah, we do 
have a process and procedure for each thing, like evicting a tenant or moving in um, a tenant. Um, but it's not so granular that, again, they don't have to think. It's not like, mm-hmm. okay, check, 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 check. Like, yep. it's kind of, because um, in, in um, Michael Lushington's blogs, he talks about different levels of granularity when you're creating yeah. a workflow and yeah. a lot of people and we'll uh, link we'll link those yeah, below we'll link too those so people can check those right out up too. below but um he says it's a very important to understand the right level of granularity for your organization like you said yeah. a 50 person a 50 door property mm-hmm. management company is different from 1000 from 6000 and yeah. so you said right now you kind of have this like certain level of granularity that's not super detailed but at 10,000 doors, who knows like right. what kind of granularity you need. But it also yeah. sounds like at some point, you might have been too granular and that's where you hit that 100%. block it, last it, year. 100%. So if you look at um, what we originally started talking about in uh, the other episode is about standardized process, we could get too standardized, right? So four years ago, Buildium came out with... Um, a, uh, a partnership with Happy Inspector, and it was like the silver bullet to inspections. Check, 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 check. You're done. Everyone's happy. Love it. We used it, and it sucked. For right? you, for, because for it was too granular? Too granular. It, it took all the critical thinking out of it for us. So so we went to a very paper-driven, still check boxes, right? Because you need that granularity. Mm-hmm. But it, it gave the property manager a little bit more creative license with what could be done. Yeah. Now we're actually finding out that that partnership between the two companies is stronger and they've made changes. And now we're coming back and implementing our paper process with that happy inspector and buildium to test it out again. Right. It's so a little bit more stuff. customizable now. I think, I don't know yeah. yet, but the idea is that we're willing to actually change that again. Cause that paper process, if we add another 400 doors, it, it ain't going to work on paper. Mm-hmm. Right. And if paper gets banned soon. Yes. Then... Right. <laughs> Yes, I'll call you my Andy. So it's like the, uh, you know, the paper in the kitchen and the coffee pods, and we have to get the little mesh thing so we can put our mm-hmm. coffee in it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Andy. Yep. I'll always bring it up. Um, but no, I mean, I have paper right here. I'm just, I'm just joshing you. I don't we make our own I'm... paper. What? Hand- we make our own paper. It's all handmade. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, it's me- a side business. Me too. <laughs> Um, yeah, but this all makes a lot of sense. Um, just constantly, constantly reevaluate. Well, making sure you have the standardized process, making sure you have your jobs, job descriptions in play, the and, operations flow. Yeah. And, um, one of the biggest learnings I had yeah. today was when we're talking about job descript- descriptions, they're not just a laundry list a of title. tasks. It's a, yeah. It's to set the tone, like to set the yeah. stage. Why am I here? Yeah. I yeah. think that's really powerful. What's my goal? And yeah. also when you're creating an org chart, like let go of what you think you know about org Don't charts. Don't think of it as a hierarchy. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. loved that. Yeah. 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 My yeah. takeaway is I, I do want to influence the job descriptions with a little bit more how you act rather than what you do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that's, that's another, I think, common denominator negativity around job description. Because you, you're taking the you're sterilizing a person yeah. who's doing that. So if I gave both of you the job description, you're both going to do it totally differently, but the job gets done. So in this case, the end does justify the mean because you're doing it your way and you're doing it your way and it's successful, right? And you're happy employees and we're happy company and we're happy clients. Yep. Yeah. We're all happy. We're all so happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think I, I don't think I have any more questions. We on beat the topic. another dead horse. We do. We're we're gonna be more. <laughs> I think this is great because I feel like um, a lot of the stuff we're talking about is it seems very no brainer. Like it seems like a no brainer, but I feel like it's not a no brainer because yeah. so many so many companies are going through the this process where they are looking at this stuff, which is great. But there are a lot of people who aren't or who don't think about it in this way yet. So just to the people who, if you do have these processes, processes mm-hmm. in place, check them out again, take a, 
take a look at what you're doing and see if you're following any of the tips that Dave suggested. Yeah, don't just do it to check a checkbox. Like, okay, right. we got the job description, we got the right, chart. Right, right. <laughs> That's not the point. Don't, the don't have a standardized process. Just so you can tell yourself, within. I've checked that box. Yeah. Right, right. Be, be, have it be something like have it living and breathing. Like yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dave. Well, yeah, we're really excited to have you for both one and two. Um, and, hopefully and maybe you'll see me at PM Grow, but I will send some people from my I'm, I love we'll the see. plural people. Yes. people. Some people, yeah. Folks. Yes. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so we much to our listeners. appreciate you. Yeah, thanks awesome. to our listeners. We, hope we, we appreciate see, you too. Yeah, and we hope we see you at PM Grow yeah, too. Yeah, come on down to PM Grow. Hang with us. Bye. Bye, guys. Oh.